1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read beginning in verse 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. And the scripture reads, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I plead again for the filling of the Holy Ghost that as I preach or wherever we go forth in power deep into our hearts, Lord, convict us where we need convicting, comfort us where we need comforting. But Father, grow us to be sure in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Father, we'll thank you for all that you do, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Backsliding. If you were to ask different people what backsliding is, some would say, well, it's losing your salvation. Of course, hopefully, they wouldn't be a member of Madison Baptist Church till they got their doctrine right. Isn't that right? But what is backsliding, and what does a backslider lose? Now, as I said, some feel you can lose your salvation. Some feel that all you lose is simply rewards, and that's it. Matter of fact, we read in verse 15, if any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Who are those that backslide? And I wonder, are there some backsliders here tonight in the service at Madison Baptist Church? We hear a lot about backsliding. And normally we think of a Christian who's committed some heinous sin, like drinking or immorality or something like that. But before we can discuss what a backslider loses, we need to understand what a backslider is. And I'm going to start by giving you the negative part, what he is it. A backslider is not an apostate. An apostate is a person who claimed to believe the cardinal doctrines of Scripture. You realize you can believe the cardinal doctrines of Scripture and still not be born again. You can believe in the deity of Christ. You can believe in a substitutionary death on the cross. You can believe his bodily resurrection from the dead. You can believe in the God-inspired scripture. You can believe all that and still die and go to hell. As Jesus told Nicodemus, a man who was fervent in prayer, a man who believed in God, a man who believed in resurrection, all of that. And yet he said to Nicodemus, Marvel not, I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Don't care who they are, they have to be born again. Matter of fact, over in... 1 Timothy chapter 4, he tells us about the last times when he says now, in beginning in verse 1, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Let me tell you something. There are a lot of people out there in the agnostic camp and in the atheist camp who at one time in their life said they believed the Bible, they believed in God, they believed in Jesus, they believed in His death, burial, and resurrection, and today they believe none of it. There are people even who spend their lives trying to get others who, uh, to not believe, and at one time they professed to believe all of those things. That is apostate. Now, it's not always one who has stopped practicing religion. Sometimes this apostate, they still practice it. Would you believe that you could go back? Uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick was the pastor. He's an atheist and was the pastor of a Baptist church. A Baptist church. As a matter of fact, if you were to go into a lot of Baptist churches tonight, Baptist, by the way, the, the central distinctive of the Baptist was, the number one distinctive is that we believe the Bible is the inspired and errant fallible word of God and is the final rule of faith and practice, and yet you can go into Baptist churches tonight that don't even believe the Bible was given by God. They just believe parts of it are inspired. They don't believe it's the final rule of practice in a local assembly of believers. And yet they still got Baptist on the door. Become apostate. 
And God says to them in 1 John 2, 19, They went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made known that they were not all of us. Uh, what else is in a bad... Uh, backslider. Backslider is not a hypocrite. Say what I mean. I'm talking about one who would profess salvation, but who in reality does not possess salvation. Of course, one of the most famous people in the Bible like that would have been Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot never became a, an apostate because he was never a believer. You understand that? You look, at, uh, you look at Judas Iscariot. Go over to John chapter 6 and notice what the scripture says. After Jesus has a confrontation with some of his disciples... The Bible says in verse 66, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. That's interesting. Peter's always so quick to speak up. And he says, and we believe that thou art the Christ. But notice verse 70. Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. He didn't say one of you will be a devil. He said one of you is a devil. Next verse. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. You know, a lot of Christianity gets a bad name from those who are simply hypocrites. I mean, people who profess salvation, but do not possess salvation. They've never been born again. I don't have any doubt a number of those hypocrites sit in churches just like ours, and every time they hear the pastor say during the invitation, if you know that you, if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven, raise your hand. They raise their hand every service, and every service that they raise it, they're thinking, I need to get this taken care of one day. But they never do. You see, the truth is, you can no more lose something you haven't got than come back from someplace you haven't been. You can't backslide from someplace that you haven't been. And in this case, these people were unbelievers. Turn, for instance, over to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. Jesus gave a warning about this, Judgment Day. He says in Matthew, chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, Judge not, I'm sorry, Matthew, chapter 7, verse 21, not verse 1, a little typo there says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never, you might underline that word never, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Several years ago, I don't know if I was out preaching somewhere, and I caught Jimmy Swagger on the TV. And he was talking about that doctrine of the Baptist that's straight out of hell, the eternal security of the believer. And to prove that you could lose your salvation, he put up on the screen these verses right here. But these verses prove exactly the opposite. Yes, these people were religious. And yes, they called him Lord, Lord. And yes, they had cast out demons. Yes, they had preached in his name. But Jesus says, I never knew you. Now see, if they had lost their salvation, he would have had to say, I knew you once, and now I've forgotten you. Doesn't say that. He says, I never knew you. John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. These people never were Jesus' sheep. They were simply hypocrites. So then what is backsliding? Well, let's see if we can get an idea. Go over to Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. And notice in verse 14. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Notice, a backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Now we've got a Bible definition. I love Bible definitions. What's a backslider in heart? It's a person who's filled with his own ways. A person who says, I don't care what area of life it is, 
that when there's something that he doesn't like that the Word of God says, he's going to do what he wants because he's filled with his own way. doesn't make any difference if that person gets good counsel about their life. They know what it is they want to do. They're going to do what they want to do because they are filled with their own ways. You see, they're like the people in the book of Judges when it says, and in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And yet in Judges chapter 2 we find that in doing what was right in their own eyes, they were doing what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord. They were doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. What was their problem? They were backsliders at heart. They were filled with their own ways. I talk to preachers about some things once in a while, and we talk about some of the ways things have changed in church life. It used to be when people had a big decision to make, maybe where they were going to go to school or about marriage or things like that, uh, or had some problems or a job, they would come and they'd talk to the pastor and say, Pastor, could you give me some counsel? Would you pray for me? Here are my decisions. Tell me what you think. Now, it's always funny to me. I know the Bible says in the multitude of counselors there is safety, but basically they'll counsel with everybody. They'll tell them what they want to do. It used to be, Brother Boar, if they come in and say, Pastor, could you give me some counsel on this? What do you think I ought to do? Today, they just come in to make an announcement. They've already decided what they're going to do. I don't argue with them. They made the announcement. I'm not going to sit there and talk them out of it. That's fine. That's the announcement you want to make. That's the decision you want to make. See, I don't give people a hard time about stuff like that. God says, if you're filled with your own ways, you're a backslider of heart. As a matter of fact, Charles Finney described a backslider this way. His zeal has grown cold. The ardor of his feelings and the depth of his piety are abated. Such a person is a backslider in heart. He may keep all the forms of religion, attend to worship, public and private, read his Bible and go through all these exercises regularly. But the spirit of it is gone. All the fine edge of pious feeling is blunted. He is a backslider in heart. Probably this applies to some of you who hear me tonight. God knows whether it does or not. Your consciences will tell you if you let them speak. Have you less ardor or feeling, less fixedness of purpose, less faithfulness and duty? If you have, then I mean you. God means you. God calls you a backslider. You see, the truth is most backsliding does not begin with an act of adultery. It not, does not begin with a night of drunkenness. It does not begin with going out and stealing something. No, no. It all begins... In the heart, when the flame begins to cool. And I dare say that most everyone here that's been saved any length of time at all would give testimony of the fact, yes, there have been times my heart has grown cold. There have been times when the ardor of the fire seemed to be burning less than what it was before. And I recognized that there was a problem. And by the way, there is a problem. One of my favorite messages that I heard several years ago was a message on duty. I do believe that we ought to do our duty as believers. But I got news for you. If you only do what you're supposed to do because of duty, it won't be long. You won't even be doing your duty. That is a tough way to live. You won't enjoy your spirituality that way. As a matter of fact, turn over to the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 2. And notice as he writes to the church at Ephesus, he says a lot of good things about this church in doing their duty. He says in verse 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. I mean, you look at his description of the church at Ephesus and it sounds like your old-fashioned Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, independent Baptist church that runs buses, that, try, that goes soul-winning, that tries to reach as many people as they can, and yet still stands by the truths of Scripture. But you look at the next verse, and he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Well, what would he have against a church whose works seem to be so biblical and right? So he tells us, Because... Thou hast left thy first love. What do you mean? They're still attending the same church. They're still doing all the same works. If 
but there's something missing in here. And so he says to him in the next verse, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do thy first works, or else I'll come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now back in chapter 1, we saw Jesus in the midst of the seven candlesticks, and he said in verse 20, and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Jesus was in the midst of the church. He's telling the church at Ephesus, if you don't get this heart right about your love for me, he said, I'll take your church out of there. I'll remove thy candlestick. He wants the people that love him. Now, not love him to where they're willing to throw away the authority of the word of God in their lives because that would prove they didn't love him too. As a matter of fact, I dare say that would be the next step at Ephesus because you can only go on that duty thing for a while. It's kind of like running your car without oil. You got, you, your, your engine may run for a while without the oil, but you'll burn it up. You'll ruin it. And there are a lot of Christians sitting around today who are burned out and they want to blame the church. They want to blame the pastor. But the truth is they were running without love and that was the problem. That love that first got them interested, that love that first got them excited about serving Jesus, that love for Christ when they first got a Sunday school class or first got a bus route, first got busy for God, they lost it. That was the beginning step of their backsliding. So it's a backslider in heart person who is filled with their own ways. So when we talk about a backslider, we're not talking about an apostate. We're not talking about the hypocrite. But the one who has let his heart be his guide instead of the word of God. So I ask the question then, what does he lose? Well, again, let me go to the negative part. What doesn't he lose? Number one, he doesn't lose his salvation. Now, the hypocrite never had it. The apostate never had it. But the believer who backsides, he has it and he can't lose it because that's wrapped up in Jesus. Just take the words of the Lord Jesus when he's talking to the woman at the well. He said, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Get that? Never thirst. For the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have what? Tell me. How long is that? That's forever. It does not end. John 5, 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He said, He that believeth on Him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. I want you to look at these promises. Turn over to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And I want you to notice beginning in verse 35. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. All that the Father hath given him, he would lose nothing, but raise it up at the last day. I quoted from John chapter 10, beginning in verse 27 a moment ago. You go on to verse 28. He said, well, let me start again in verse 27. He says, um, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never, never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now, did you get that? In the next verse, by the way, he says, no man's able to pluck them out of my hand. He says, I and the Father are one. In Romans cha or Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, he tells us, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So just wrap the sealing of the Holy Ghost around the Father's hand, around the Son's hand, 
And it says, do not open until redemption day. Not till the next time you sin, but till redemption day. Brother, that is secure. Yeah, the backslider of heart, that's bad. It's wrong. It needs to be taken care of. But he does not lose his salvation because that's not possible. I believe the words of God. Philippians 1, 6, I quoted this, quoted it this morning. Being confident of this one thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 38, he says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's secure. Now I dare say, if there was anybody in the Bible that could have lost their salvation, it would have been the man that you read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So I want you to turn over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The Holy Ghost of God writes, he says it's reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily... As absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit, and with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, look at it, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Why were they turning his body over to Satan to be destroyed? See, Jesus, or Paul didn't have any doubt this guy was going to heaven, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, I'd be a man that we'd look at and we'd say, you know, there's no way that guy could be saved. Look at the sin he was in. Well, what about Lot? You look at Lot living in Sodom and Gomorrah, calling the people brethren. You look at Lot willing to give up his two virgin daughters to the wicked men that were outside to do as they please. You look at Lot and see the wickedness that he participated in after he got out of Sodom and Gomorrah. We said there's no way that man could be saved. And yet the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2 that God delivered just, that is righteous, Lot who had vexed his righteous soul from day to day. You see, thank God you may be a backslider at heart tonight. But one thing you can't lose is your salvation. So if he can't lose his salvation, what does he lose? Number one, let me give you four things tonight. He loses assurance of his salvation. Now, I know 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. But when you take a person that begins to put his own personal feelings as authority over the Word of God, what he's saying is he trusts himself more than he trusts God's Word. You need God's Word for the assurance of salvation. I mean, a lot of people tell, have told me about their salvation experience where they got all excited and, man, they felt just chill bumps coming over them and they cried and wept and they shouted and hollered. And they say, well, you're going to heaven when you die. I don't know. The feeling was nice, but, but sure, assurance doesn't come from the feelings. It's got to come from the Word of God. As a matter of fact, turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want you to notice verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 1. Salvation's a wonderful thing, but how... I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1. That's what I want. He tells us in the verses before this that we are to be diligent to add some things to our faith. And he says in verse 8 after that, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. How in the world could you forget that? Now, he doesn't forget. 
Isn't that right? He doesn't forget. But a person can forget that they've been purged from their sins. if They don't give diligence to add certain things to their faith. He goes on to say, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now somebody comes to me and says, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not going to say, No, no, I know you're saved because I don't know that. No way I can know that. They're going to have to get their assurance from the Word of God. But if they are filled with their own ways, if they're saying no to God in different areas of their life, then they are not going to get the assurance that they need. As a matter of fact, turn over to the book of uh, Matthew again, chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And notice how God puts it here in Matthew chapter 7. Very important. Verse 24. He says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, the wind blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, and the floods came, winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I've heard preachers get up and say, we're talking about building your faith on the rock of Christ. Not in that passage, you're not. Now the rock that followed the Israelites in the wilderness that gave them water, that rock was Christ. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But that rock's not Christ. The wise man is a man who heard the word of God and obeyed it. And when the storms of life came, he stood. But the foolish man was the man who heard the same word of God and didn't obey it. What's the difference between the rock and the sand? Obedience to the Word of God. And the ones that don't obey it. There is, I've heard people say to me, Preacher, I had a great tragedy and people came over to share Scripture with me to comfort me and it seemed like God was mocking me. Well, that tells me then that there was a problem somewhere in their life. Because you see, that rock part, that part about not falling comes from being obedient to the Word of God. He warns us in James chapter 1, verse 22, Be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. They can lose the assurance of their salvation. You know, it's tough when you're not sure of things. As I get older now, I don't know about you, but I get less and less sure of my own ability to walk. Anybody, anybody there yet? Man, I, I tell you what, you... I used to be one of those guys, you know, athlete. And, you know, to go flying and rolling in the ground didn't scare me. It scares me to death now. But have you ever had this happen? You set the alarm, you go to bed, you're laying there in the bed, and it's not long, you think, I wonder if the alarm set. And you go over and you look at it, yeah, it's set. And you lay back down. You're laying there 15 minutes, you know, I wonder if I felt that right. I wonder if that alarm set. I guarantee you there are some, there are some people here that you've left for church and you've gotten about a half block away. He said, I wonder if I turned the stove off. I wonder if I left the coffee pot on. And you go back and check. I still do this. Now, when I leave, of course, we put the garage door down. And I get half block away. I wonder if I remember to push that button to put the door down. And I turn around and go back. You know it's tough when you don't have assurance of some things. You know that. But the toughest thing of all would not to be sure of your own salvation. He even says, make your calling and election sure. And yes, that's not just through believing what the Word of God has to say, but walking in obedience to what the Word of God has to say. Do you have that kind of surrender? Not only do they, can they lose assurance of salvation, but they definitely lose the joy of their salvation. Turn to the book of Psalms. Psalm 51. Now, of course, Psalm 51 is David's repentant prayer. His prayer of repentance after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, committed murder with her husband. And now the prophet of God has come to him and stood in rebuke of him. He has said to the prophet, I have sinned. And Psalm 51 is his prayer to get right with God. And you notice in verses 8 and 9, here is part of the prayer after he confesses his sin and his transgression and his iniquity to God. He says in verse 8, Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, 
and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. You know, I don't know about you, but as I heard these young people give testimony tonight, that thrills my heart. They're excited about being saved. Now, and for most of them, they haven't been saved very long. At the most, just a year or two, usually. Truth is, there are people here who have been saved 40 years. You ought to be saying, thank God I, for my salvation. Amen. You ought to be excited about it. Here's a danger for us people who've been saved 30 years and longer. As we go to church because we're supposed to go to church, we're not going because we're excited about going to church. We're not going excited about what we get to hear and what we're going to hear that can help our life. We're looking forward to the popcorn or whatever afterwards. Or going to, is that Brewster's ice cream place? Is that what it is? Or Wendy's and the fellowship afterwards instead of excited about the fellowship with the people of God. You know, it's funny. These people, they can get up early to drive all the way over to Auburn or all the way down to Tuscaloosa. And it may be freezing outside. They'll go to the stadium an hour and a half to two hours early. And they'll sit there in excitement for what's about to happen. And yet they're not going to see anything new. They're going to see people run the ball. They're going to see people get tackled. They're going to see people throw passes. They're going to see passes dropped. They're going to see passes caught. They're going to see touchdowns scored, they hope, for their team. And they may see a field goal or two, but they're really not going to see anything they haven't seen before. And yet every year they continue to go back and they spend a fortune. And if it goes into overtime, that's even better. Because they love it. We go to the house of God. And if the preacher goes past 7.30 on Sunday night, he's in overtime. When is he ever going to shut up? Does he, just, does he just love hearing himself talk? Listen, that says more about our own heart than it does about the preacher or the church or anything else. I mean, when people get... Pastor says amen, and they can't wait to be the first one to their cars. I understand when visitors are like that. I don't understand members being like that, except for the fact it says there's something missing in here. Here's your opportunity to fellowship with the other believers. There is a joy in that. Unless, of course, you're a backslider in heart. You understand what I'm saying? The joy of your salvation. Man, you don't have to commit adultery to lose the joy of your salvation. Matter of fact, a whole lot of people who commit sins like that, that or drinking or other things, they had lost their joy for a long time, never got it taken care of. So as a result, it's nothing for them to miss a service. It's nothing to miss a service. Because they don't really go there to get anything anyway. They're just going to put their time in. And they feel like maybe they've had a parole for a service to be able to get out. They have lost the joy of their salvation. Now the thing is, when you get into other sin, whether it's that, pornography, whatever it may be, I want you to notice, turn to Psalm 38. Psalm 38 is the psalm that David wrote that described what he was going through in that year that he was backslidden on God. The year after he had committed the immorality and committed the murder and all that, because after all, he did not get right with God until after the baby was born. And some would say, well, look at King up there in the palace. He's still got all the finery and he's got servants waiting on him. Where's the chastening hand of God? But all you're looking at is the outside. Here he describes what was going on on the inside. When he said in verse, 30, or verse 1, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There's no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is any rest in my bones because of my sin. Yes, yeah, he laid on those silk sheets that night, and that silk pillow, as he lay there every night, 
He would toss and turn because the one that he wants to sweet fellowship with, the one that he could sit down and write about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now all he sees are the arrows of God coming at him in God's displeasure and God's chastisement. He's misery. Yeah, he may still be in the palace, but he's in misery. He goes on. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head. As a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I'm bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease. And there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before thee. And my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it is gone from me. This is the man who wrote in Psalm 27, verse 1. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire at his temple. I mean, this is the man who said, as a heart panteth after the water brook, so my heart panteth after thee. Ah, but now he's broken. Yeah, you lose the joy of your salvation. What else do you lose? Reward at the judgment seat of Christ. Go back to the passage we began with. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And notice in verse, well, let's read verses 13 through 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work. Notice, it doesn't say of how much it is. It doesn't say of how big it is. It says of what sort it is. You know, there is a difference in reward for the person who goes out door knocking because he loves Jesus and the person who goes out door knocking because he's supposed to. There is a difference in the reward. There's a difference in the reward for the person who goes out and works that bus route three and four hours on a Saturday trying to get kids to come because they love Jesus and they want the kids to love him too. Different reward between that person and the one who's going out there because they've been going, people are expecting them and they don't want to have to answer to a bunch of people if they stop going. You see, the reward is according to what sort it is. Then he says, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. What are those things that you've done for Christ? We have a song. I think it's in this hymn book too. I'm not really sure. I know it's been all the other hymn books that we've had. Written by Robert Robinson. Come thou fount of every blessing. He had lost the joy of the happy communion that he had had with God when he wrote that song. He had lost that joy in his later years. He had been wounded by the wages of sin, had a deeply troubled spirit. He decided to travel, and in his travels, he became acquainted with a young lady who was really astute to spiritual matters. And she didn't know his full name, just knew him as Robert. And she said, let me share a song with you. That's been a tremendous blessing to my heart. And she began to read from his song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. As she read it, he wept. He cried out, I'd give anything to experience the joy I knew then. You know, isn't it interesting? Maybe that's why he wrote in that last verse, he says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We all have a proneness for that. And the reason for that is we're still cumbered about with this flesh. That's why the Bible says we're to add diligently certain things to our faith. That's why it says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And the first thing he tells you is, put away from you a forward mouth. We live in a day where we've got to be critical about everything, and it's sapping our heart from the joy 
that we had in Christ. That's one of the things I love about Joe Arthur. I, I, yeah, I love his preaching. Don't misunderstand me. And you've got to admit, even if there was no sound coming out, there'd be entertainment in just watching his facial expressions. <laughs> Isn't that right? But Brother Joe and I have been out to eat a number of times. And he is one of the most positive fellows I think I've ever met. He's not one that sits around. Have you heard about Brother so-and-so? Yeah, he messed up. Have you heard about him over it? Well, he did that. None of that ever comes out of his mouth. You know, there's a reason, I think, that he has a lot of that joy that he seems to have every time he preaches, and he preaches every night of this world someplace. How can you do it like that all the time? Well, the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The Bible says in everything give thanks for this will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The Bible says rejoice evermore. See, he's very careful about what comes out of his mouth. No wonder the psalmist prayed, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth and keep the door of my lips. Because you start letting the wrong things come out of your mouth and it'll set it all in stone on your heart. And brother, that joy will be gone. Reward. How terrible to lose reward. But something else happens too. And that is the reaping of service. You lose the things you could have reaped because of service unperformed. I mean, after all, when, when you go long enough on just simply duty, you go long enough at just fulfilling what you think people expect of you, and you're not doing it in the love for Jesus anymore like you once did, that ardor is not there any longer. And it won't be long, you'll start missing, and then the missing will become more frequent. You realize the hardest time to just miss church on a church night is the first time. The second time it's easier. I'm not talking about when you're sick. I mean sick. I mean laid up in a hospital someplace. I mean you're just so sick you can't even get out. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just, eh, you know, I'm a little tired tonight. I think I'll just stay home. Hardest time to do this, first time. It's like I've said many times about when I, when I counsel husbands and wives, especially the premarital counseling, the hardest time for a man to hit his wife is the first time. If he hits her the first time, more than likely he'll be hitting her a second time not too long from now. Second hardest time to hit his wife is the second time. Every time he does, it gets easier. Hardest time for that guy to get drunk is the first time. Second time, it's easy. Sin's like that, you know. The more you do it, the more it gets easier to do. And it gets so that it's so easy to sin, it gets hard to even do right after that. There are a lot of people sitting out there. They just started missing one service a week. Then eventually it went to two. And then eventually they found, hey, they could even not have to show up on Sunday and do just fine. And you go visit them today. They'll talk about how they used to be there. But they just can't seem to get up and go now. Why is it so hard now? Chains of sin, that's what it does to you. But here's the thing. When you're in that backslidden state, you're not serving God. You're not going to soul winning. You're not giving like you used to give. You're not serving the Lord and getting joy from service anymore. All that service is gone. Listen, the harvest is truly white, but the laborers are few. And when you've got laborers who are dropping out of the service, do you realize that in America today, we're not even replacing the missionaries that we have out there now? There are more coming home off the field than are going. And we wonder why Islam's taking over Europe, why it's multiplying in America, why there are a lot of places you can't even go and knock on a door in America to tell people about Jesus? I'll tell you why, because the church is fine with not serving Christ. I'll just be a good Christian sitting in the pew. And they will reap for their unperformed service. Here's what some people think, though. They think, well, at least I'm going to heaven, and that is what counts. Do you think that'll count when you stand before them? I mean, these people here, it said in verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. 
Do you think these people, after standing before the one who died for them, the one who saved them, that when Jesus says, well, you know, some of those rewards that you had, they're gone. They'll say, well, well, that's okay. At least I'm here. Think that'll be sufficient? Dr. Bob Kelly, who's in heaven today, one of my dear friends, I I think about him often and, and I miss him. He was a great preacher and a great friend of preachers. He was a tremendous preacher. Bob Kelly, when he was in Bible college in Chattanooga, Tennessee, in his younger days, of course, he would go out and play the trumpet and sing sometimes for Dr. Faulkner. And they, he would drive Dr. Faulkner to some of the meetings that they would go to. And he told the story about how one time they were coming back late at night. They were coming in over Missionary Ridge. And as they came over the, the road there at Missionary Ridge and looked down upon the city of Chattanooga, they saw a fire. And I want to say it wasn't the East Ridge area. East Lake area, I think, was the name of the area. Is there an East Lake in Chattanooga? Yeah, I think there is. There was, a, there was a house that was burning. Dr. Faulkner said, let's go over and see if we can be a help for anybody. And so they, he drove over to the place where the house was on fire. Of course, most of the neighborhood was out there and around there. There were fire trucks around and all of that. And as they got out and as they were, they were just kind of taking in the scene, they noticed that there was a mother over here and she was screaming. She was saying, my baby, my baby's inside. Please, let me go in and get my baby. My baby's inside. It was interesting. He said, she wasn't standing there saying, well, at least I got out okay. You've got family. You've got friends. You've got people you know that you care about lost on their way to hell. And you think when you get to heaven, you're going to be satisfied with just being there. And they didn't get there. I don't think so. He said, well, there aren't going to be tears in heaven. No, you really misread that because the Bible says, after the great white throne, and he shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. When we see people we didn't talk to that we could have, people that we could have begged and we could have pleaded with to proclaim the gospel to them, but we didn't because we didn't want to be embarrassed. People that would have been reached had we just gotten active and busy in the work of God. We will be weeping. Then he drives and wipes all tears from our eyes. Yeah, backsliders get to go to heaven. But you know, that for a while there, it's not going to be a very enjoyable time. And on top of that, you lose the blessing and joy of walking with God now. You say, preacher, how do I get it back? Well, in the passage we read in Revelation chapter 2, he said, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do thy first works. Remember what it was like when you couldn't get enough of that Bible? You'd read it and verses would jump off the page and you'd say, wow, man, that is so good. And you had to go around and share it with people. Couldn't wait to get in. Couldn't wait to have your prayer time. And today, well, let's see, when was the last time I had a good prayer time with God? I mean, more than just asking the blessing on the food. I mean, a time when you just, just want to be with God. Just want to kind of sit up in his lap and just say, Lord, hold me for a while. I just want to snuggle. I just want to spend some time with you, Lord. Some of you remember times like that, and they haven't been there for a while. And guess what? He's not happy about it either. But he's not the one who moved. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Dear God, deal with our hearts. There are some under the sound of my voice tonight. They've already experienced the loss of joy and their salvation. They're running on duty. The joy is gone. Lord, some have even backed out of what they used to do because you can only go so far just on duty. God, there are some tonight who are longing to have what they once had. I pray, dear God, tonight you deal with their hearts and may we decide that we're not going to be backslidden in heart anymore. We're tired of being filled with our own ways that only lead to pain and unhappiness and sorrow. 
And we want to be filled with you and your ways and your word. God, deal with our hearts tonight, I pray. In Jesus' name.